Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Particle Physics for Kids uh, virtual science camp. So, as you can see, we're focused on a cloud chamber here. I'm at Char the Charles University in Prague with Wojtek Pleskot. Did, did I say it right? Pleskot. Pleskot, uh, who's the IPOG representative for the Czech Republic. IPOG is the International Particle Physics Outreach Group. And he's a researcher here at the Charles University, and correct me if I'm wrong with any of this, and uh, works with the Atlas Collaboration at CERN. Um, Ted, thank you for having me. We're going to see his uh, science show, uh, Radioactivity is Everywhere. And I'm really excited because I think I'm going to get to take part in some of it. So thank you again for joining us, and thank you for uh, having me here with you. Thank you very much for- Should I focus on you now? Um, yeah, you can. Uh, maybe let's let's turn the lights on a tiny bit. Well, just, just to mention, also for Wojtek to know, even though it's not a huge group, we have people joining from I think seven different countries. There seems to be someone from Turkey, Brazil, Ireland, the United States. I saw one of my students from France and a friend from France, Slovakia. If I missed anyone, feel free to shout and say where you're joining us from, uh, so we know what an international crowd we have. Uh, thank you all for joining us. That sounds pretty cool. So hi, everybody, to the very different countries from all over the world. I hope you can hear me well. Just give a sign to me or Michael, if not. And oh, do we have any audio uh, system hooked up? Like if I turn this on, we'll get audio feedback. Uh, we can test it, yes. We've... Okay, sorry in advance if we get horrible feedback. Uh, we we can get a slight echo. Yeah. So I, I guess we'll just depend on the chat, mm -hmm. not really anything from the chat. Okay, you know, sometimes I like you guys uh, jumping on and shouting. We just uh, didn't think of that part of the audio setup. So we'll mainly do things in the chat if you want. And. Uh, Yes, sound is good. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for confirming that the sound is good. Okay, Great. Perfect. Uh, back to you, Wojtek. Right thank you very much. So now maybe I will share a presentation with you. No, we forgot one more thing, an important one. To, to introduce E.T. as well, who's okay. hiding behind. And no, 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 please come, Yuri. Come, 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 come. So it seems like Yuri may or may not so, be shy, but he's, yeah. he's one of, uh, he's a very, uh, uh, well, I just met him, but yeah. from what I've heard, he's an excellent professor and yeah. does a lot of teacher training for physics teachers, supporting the great physics teachers here in the Czech Republic. Yeah, uh, so thanks for being with us, Yuri. Thank you. He is a teacher of mine and taught me particle physics, and I'm grateful to him for having introduced me to particle physics outreach as well. So thank you, Iri, and it's nice that you are, you are here today with us. So now let me share, I've prepared a couple of slides because I'm going to talk about how to detect a radioactive rays, radioactivity, and I'm going to show you two devices. One of them is the cloud chamber over here that you've just seen at the very beginning. We are going to build the cloud chamber and I'm looking forward to it and Michael is going to help me with the construction. And I'm looking forward to doing that because I haven't built a cloud chamber since I've lasted so, <laughs> so this is a real treat for me. Very nice. So before we go into the construction, let me tell you very briefly what the cloud chamber is. It's not the thing we are looking at on the slides. I hope you can see the slides, all of you. But cloud chamber is more like this. I'm pretty sure you've seen such a device in different places, maybe at universities or somewhere. I, I think one or two of you were on, on your sessions in school lab a couple of weeks ago when I was in Ghana. Yeah. And so you might have seen it then as well, but not the same application. <laughs> cool. So on the picture in the slide, there is a there is a very sophisticated cloud chamber, probably cooled by a Peltier or something like this. 
uh, here in the room, we have a simpler one and I will explain how it's cooled in a bit. Anyway, we are grateful to this guy, Charles Thompson Rees, for having invented the cloud chamber. And just after the, the invention of the cloud chamber, this person, Carl David Anderson, discovered antimatter anti with a cloud chamber. Uh, well, the particle that he discovered was a, a positron, which is an antiparticle to the electron that's all around in atoms. And this picture we are looking at is the first photo of a uh, antimatter that people have taken. A, a tiny bit later, uh, Victor Franz Hess discovered cosmic radiation, cosmic rays, again with the usage of a cloud chamber. So he <clears throat> built balloons and put the cloud chamber into the balloon and uh, let the balloon fly very high to the atmosphere. And there, the, the activity of the cosmic rays is higher than here in the, in the Earth's surface. So there was a higher activity in his detector, like the, the cloud chamber that was there in the balloon. And he could immediately see the, the higher activity from which he concluded that there's something going from the Earth, from the universe to the Earth, and that's a bit shielded by the atmosphere. So the higher you are, the less shielded you are, the more cosmic radiation you, you detect. Uh, there's a bit of the person, Victor Frances, wasn't from the Czech Republic, no, not at all. But he done one of his experiments here in the Czech Republic. Some of his balloons flew from a city that's 100 kilometers far away to the north from, from Prague, from the place where we are right now. And you might or might not know, but not all the participants will know the hot air balloon was invented in France. So we give a shout out to <laughs> country as well. And out of curiosity, I know hot air balloon in a lot of countries' names. What's the name in Czech? The name of a balloon? Yeah, of a hot air balloon, like the uh, first one called. Balloon. Uh, <laughs> in so many languages, it's just the French name Montgolfier, or uh, so, like a weird pronunciation of it in other languages because it was the Montgolfier brothers who invented it. Sorry about that. <laughs> we call it that. <laughs> so just why not to say C? <laughs> so sorry for the interruption. Oh, and do you want do you want me to keep interrupting you? Yes, yes, yes. Please go ahead. Okay. And if there's a question from the public in the Zoom, please don't be shy and ask. Oh yeah, and please be like. If, if I don't see that you have a question, try and make this out as attentive as possible because we don't have the, the sound on you. Or I'll... I think the sound... I'll, if, if, if someone can say something, we okay. should... So, so someone try saying something. So someone in the audience, like one of the eager uh, people who always participates, <laughs> like Paul, if you can turn on your microphone for a sec. Just so we can see if we can hear you, if you want to shout out. Yeah, can you hear me? We can yeah. hear you very well. Thank you, yes. No problem. Great to be with you. Great, great to be with you too. Hopefully you're not too tired after the trip back to uh, Ireland after the festival. Yeah, so maybe you can mute in your laptop. Thanks. So we can see that there's an anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-anti-an
millionth of a second, uh, which is long enough to reach the Earth at a speed of light. And I should have said that the muons or most of particles that we detect in devices like the, uh, like the cloud chamber or another one I will show you a tiny bit later on. So all these particles typically fly at the, at the speed of light. So if you fly at the speed of light from the top of the atmosphere to the air surface, you can reach it within less than 10 to the minus six seconds or not going to the details of, yeah. <laughs> In fact, the, the, the fact that you are flying at the speed of light is what makes your, your life longer. Neutrinos can break the speed of light. <laughs> Neutrinos, no, they can't. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> no. So let's come back to the cosmic rays. At the top of the atmosphere, a charged party or a particle hits a nucleus. Pions are born in that collision. They decay to muons. And the muons are particles that we detect in our cloud chamber. Good. So uh, this picture in the slide is uh, three types of particles that you will be able to see in our cloud chamber. Uh, they are alpha particles, electrons, and muons. Electrons are the beasts that live in, in, in an atom. Muons are very close in behavior to electrons. In fact, we typically say muon is a sort of a brother of an electron. All its properties are the same. It interacts with other particles in exactly the same way as an electron but uh, its mass is higher than that of an electron, which makes its, uh, uh, <clears throat> its trace in a cloud chamber quite different from the one of an electron. So keep that in mind. I will anyway remind you once more. And a third type of radiation that we will see in the cloud chamber are alpha particles. So let's go through these three types of radiation one by one. And let's explain what makes them visible in a cloud chamber and why their trace there is uh, what we will see. So alpha particle, it's a nucleus of a, of a helium of the, of the gas. And from the point of view of particles that we deal with, it's a very heavy particle with a strong electric charge twice more than a proton or an electron. And if you imagine a matter like here, this table, or my body, or the vapors in the cloud chamber, if you imagine this as a cloud of electrons, so all the particles passing through a matter see it mostly as a cloud of electrons. So if you imagine an ordinary matter as a cloud of electrons, then you can imagine an alpha particle passing through this matter as a medicine ball passing through a cloud of ping pong balls. So it's sketched on the slide here. And you can imagine what happens if you throw a medicine ball to a cloud of, of ping pong balls. It, it makes a spray of ping pong balls all here and there. And it makes a very strong signal in the in the detector because every ping pong ball will be in the end sort of uh, uh, transferred or converted into a, a current, electric current signal that our detector will be able to see. If it's a silicon detector, if it's a cloud chamber, I will explain you <laughs> again a tiny bit later how this signal appears there. Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. So the muon then, does it have a bigger physical dimension than the electron or is it considered a point object or a wave? And it's just that its energy or its mass energy or its mass energy or its mass energy is bigger. So then it has a, a similar effect to what a medicine ball, like it being a bigger physical dimension as well. Maybe. I can see, thank you for the question. So the physical dimensions of all these particles we are talking about are basically the same. So electron and a muon, we uh, 
nowadays we view them as point particles, so without any physics, physical dimensions. Uh, the, the alpha particle is different. It's a composite object composed of several, several elementary particles, but still it's very tiny and its dimensions are not going to make a difference for its interactions with the, with the cloud of electrons with, with matter. So, okay, so it'd be a, lo a lot less visually striking, but if teachers wanted to go from one analogy to another saying, is this also correct and uh, would explain the situation? If we thought of it, if we did a similar thing, like just thought experiment now, we threw a tennis ball through a bunch of ping pong balls, and then we had a tennis ball that was filled with water, or filled with chocolate or lead that made it significantly heavier. So there, it would still hit this, a similar number of ping pong balls because it has more mass and more energy. It's knocking a lot of them a lot further. So we might see, well, we, I would predict, we, we might need to try to see how big the effect is. I would predict that we'd see the ping pong ball, balls go further with the like lead um, tennis ball. Yeah, well, what makes the, 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 the affected area, the impacted area of an alpha particle Bigger is its charge. Well, no, not with but the alpha, with the muon versus electron. Muon versus the alpha, of course, is big. I can see. So let's go to an electron. It's like a ping pong ball hitting a cloud of, of ping pong balls. And it, if it collides head on with a, another ping pong ball, then uh, the original one goes right back. Uh, and the collisions of a ping pong ball with a ping pong ball can be. Uh, like that you stop your original thing and the other gets most of its kinetic energy or you hit one and turn. Which, we'll see we, we which we will see, yes, yes, yes. We will see paths of the electron like there are, there are wiggles and, and stuff. And, and so With, the muon, because it's the same, Multi-point size. I, I visualize it as a golf ball. But the, the difference between the muon and the electron in this case is just that the muon would tend to keep going straight when it goes That's it, the yes, yes, okay. yes. And we will see very narrow straight lines in the cloud chamber and here in the detector as well. That they, they will be muons because they don't change direction after colliding with, with an electron. They are 200 times heavier than an electron. And really this analogy of a golf ball with a ping pong ball is a good one, I think. Perfect, thank you. And everyone uh, in the Zoom, don't be shy if you have questions as well. I don't think many have come up, but it's not just for me to ask questions. We're doing this so you guys can ask uh, any questions you want. Um, so don't let me hog all the attention. Don't be shy if you have anything to ask. Yeah, don't be shy. So one last thing, but maybe yeah. what are the sources of radioactivity we are going to see in our cloud chamber and in the other detector that here. So cosmic rays, I've said it already, but there are other sources. And one important one is a isotope that's gaseous, that it's gas, it's, uh, it's called radon. Or radon? Or uh, radon. 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 Although I, I don't know if right. different accents pronounce it different. I, I okay. think most is more or less just radon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Radon. So it's a decay product of very heavy isotopes like uranium, thorium, and so on. They are common in, in, in materials we build buildings from. And also they are sort of common in, in the earth at the surface. So it's not very surprising that radon, radon goes from these materials and we breathe it in the air, it's, it's everywhere. By the way, if you are building a new, new house, then you should measure the amount of radon that's being produced by the materials from which you, you do it and from the earth. And if it's too much, you will have trouble getting agreement to and, and one of the reasons why it can be 
the problem is because radon is heavier than air, so it'll tend to accumulate in the basement. Because unlike gases that are lighter, if it's slowly being produced by the house, I mean, it wouldn't produce, well, helium maybe from alpha particles, then that'll float around and it's easier to float, or to float, or to float away rather than accumulate across the problem. <laughs> accumulate to problematic <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Uh, I should have said that the Czech Republic is sort of rich in radon. <laughs> so we will definitely see some alpha particles to which radon decays in the in the detector. But apart from that, it's everywhere anyway. It's just the amount that's a bit higher here than, than elsewhere. Uh, yeah. So now to the construction of the cloud chamber, Michael, if you can help Excellent. me. Excellent, yes, yeah, so this is so where I get to do it. You see one here, it's constructed for you. We were if we watching need a it. second camera, let me know. Uh, I think later it's fine for probably. now, okay. but so you are being. So for you to see how it was constructed. So Michael will take the dry ice, which is in this box here. I bought it in the morning for about oh, 10 we euros. Left, we left the cup inside. <laughs> yeah, oh, sorry about that. No, Too cool. No, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Maybe, do you want a glove? No, no, no. Like it, it actually is fine. Oh, good. It, it, it warms up good. quite quickly. It's, it's a decent insulator. <laughs> then you can take the box. And put the dry ice into it. Meanwhile, I take the... And the box, just to show, is polystyrene, which is a very good insulator. And there's a groove, it's like a one centimeter or so groove that uh, I'm going to pile it in the middle here. Oh, can someone uh, tell us, can you hear me okay? Because I don't have a clip on my, like, uh, voice deck. But I can, I can either shout even louder, or I can get my mouth right next to him if I need to. No, we can just turn on a second mic. So can you hear Michael well? Can anyone jump on their mic to let us know if uh, you can hear me okay when I'm talking? Or maybe can you ask that because if they can't hear me, they wouldn't know to say they can't hear me. Okay. Can you say whether you can hear Michael when he's talking? Yeah, that's fine. Perfect. Okay, Excellent. perfect. Thank you. And so uh, while, while Michael's putting the dry ice into the box, let me uh, spray the the tissue here with uh, isopropylene. It's a type of alcohol whose vapors are great for the cloud chamber construction. Let me explain you in a, in a bit. How, how flat does this need to be? Uh, it needs to be pretty flat, I would okay. say. And, and uh, a, a funny thing I thought of when I was asking if you could hear me, and of course, if you couldn't hear me, you wouldn't know that the question was asked. When I moved to France way back many years ago, at one of the immigration meetings, if we needed to go to a bunch of meetings, they asked in French and in French only, anyone who needs a translator, put your hand up now, or you have no chance to, the day, uh, to have anything other than in French. And so there were a lot of people who just looked confused why some people had put their hands up. And it seemed to be an important question. They had no, no idea what was going on till me and a couple of the others started whispering out of the room. If you didn't understand uh, it, like in English, and yeah, I guess I didn't speak Spanish or Italian at the time, just in English. If you need a translator, put up your hand. But funny that uh, like, but me doing exactly the same thing. If you can't hear me, let me know. <laughs> Oh, right. so, I'm not supposed to go away. I stick here. And I exactly. Okay, now, so please. We do this. Oh, you explain that we do this. Yeah. Part, right? So now we put the metallic plate on the on the dry ice, ready to go, and then the nice sound, isn't it? So now the metallic plate is being cooled to the temperature of the dry ice, which is minus 80 degrees of Celsius. And how many squeaks like that? Is it that it's shouting from excitement? It gets to be a cloud chamber. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Or, or it might just be that it's uh, parts of it contract faster because there's such a big temperature change. But I like to think it's shouting along with yeah, us. The excitement is a better explanation, I think. So please put it away. So now the metallic plate is just an ordinary metal aluminum. 
but it needs to be decently thick. So it's being cooled to the temperature of the dry ice, which is minus 80 Celsius. And here at the top, we have the, the alcohol that's at the room temperature, which is plus 20. And as it vaporizes, the, the, the vapors go down and they get cooled. So from plus 20 to minus 80, which is at the, at the metallic plate. And they get cool so fast that they get overcooled, in fact. And in the overcooled state, they become somewhere near the bottom, near the metallic plate at, at this high, approximately. And here at this high, the, the ideal atmosphere of the cloud chamber, the desired thing is occurring. So let me say it it's an overcooled vapor of, of some. Type of an alcohol, and and sometimes you see I say it's super saturated, like a super saturated solution in a liquid is when you have like if if you want to dissolve a lot of sugar in water, like if you like drinking sugar water, so there's some kids you might like that. So if you add a bunch and then no more dissolves, if you heat the water up, you can get more to dissolve, and then you can cool it back down. And if it stays dissolved, it's a super saturated solution because it uh, you have more of the sugar dissolved. That should be able to dissolve in the water at this temperature. And oh, goodbye. Thanks for joining us. Um, and lost my sentence. And the uh, same thing happens in a gas. So the uh, alcohol vapor is in, uh, uh, in the air and we don't see it uh, because it's saturated, just like a saturated sugar solution. We don't see crystals. And as the temperature gets lower, we have the same amount of. Uh, of alcohol because it doesn't have anywhere to go, but at the lower temperature, it shouldn't be dissolved. And so it'll come out a solution really easily. Just like if you're making rock candy out of a sugar solution, you could sometimes, although seeding a crystal doesn't work that well with sugar, but if you put sugar in, then you could get more of the sugar solution crystallizing out. Cool, thanks. So, uh, and let me know if you get tired of my interruption. No, 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 no. I like it. <laughs> okay, I like it. Uh, thank I'm you. used to teaching, so I always jump in and say, oh, I did this as well. And we do have people kind of from a lot of different ages yeah. and levels. So okay. some people might benefit from that. Probably most of you already knew everything I just said. But it's nice to hear me saying it again sometimes. <laughs> and you pick up new things from different explanations. Like I've seen this cloud, well, I've seen a cloud chamber like this made at CERN a couple of times. But every time I see a new person show it to me, I learned new things that, that work better. Like one of the things, and I think Anya's still on uh, here. She's at school labs and you saw her make a cloud chamber. I really like this spray bottle better than the squirt bottles to use at CERN. So that's a suggestion. Right now I'm attempting to uh, suggest to Anya uh, that that's worth a try if you guys haven't tried that out already. Um, so it's always worth seeing experiments multiple times because there's always new things to pick up from new people. Thank you, Michael. Now, a friend of mine has come. It's Martin Ribas. Oh, yes, Martin, Martin. And thank, thank you for coming. So uh, those of you who watched the link that I sent ahead of time saying, if you want to see more about Wojtek and his life, uh, and if you watch A Day with Particles, you'll recognize Martin as the colleague that shares an office with him. And Martin will be joining as well. He said tentatively, yes. Um, it, we haven't confirmed a date or anything, but. Hopefully he's gonna join us later on this month uh, for a session on heavy ion collisions. I think there were questions when Steve Goldfarb was showing us around the Atlas detector uh, about, I think I asked him even, what other than protons do you do collide? Well, part of the team, including Martin, works on that as his specialty. So I'm thrilled that we'll get to hear about that. Can yeah. you introduce yourself? Yeah, so hello everybody. So as uh, I was introduced, my name is Martin and I'm also an experimental physicist working along, alongside with Wojtek on the Atlas experiment. But typically like uh, LHC provides collisions of protons so like 90% of the time. But typically like uh, for like once month, one month per year, uh, the LHC switch to collision of, of, of ions. We can collide uh, lead ions, we can collide proton and ion. We had collisions of oxygen, uh, of uh, xenon, and we are going to have collisions of, uh, of oxygen in, in two years. And basically what we are trying to do is that we are trying to make like a little bit bang. So create like a matter that is like an extremely hot and extremely dense. So something that is like a 100 times 
hotter than what is the inside of the uh, of the sun. So I'll be talking uh, <laughs> maybe within like a next month or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we, we said tentatively uh, late yeah. April, but exactly, we're yeah. we're going to communicate with each other. Exactly, yeah. Once I have the dates, I'll let you guys know. I, I point but, to my computer, but the camera's yeah. there. <laughs> uh, so, and I have a lot more questions to ask you about that, but we'll wait till that session rather than uh, interrupting Dwight's session. Exactly. So, okay. But so, I've invited Martin for one purpose oh, also, oh, not, not to just to introduce him, now. but to tell us why the overcooled vapor, the saturated one, detects uh, radioactive rays. So it was the question, why? <laughs> why? why can we see the traces? of the right so because uh, when there is a, a particle that is charged that, that's important whether it's coming through the uh, the chamber it ionizes the the environment and yeah. those those ions is basically create like a like a seed for the condensation so it's it uh, so along along the, the the path you basically start to see the condensation of these uh, alcohol vapor and that's why we can we can see them. Indeed. Thank you very much. Okay. And I will return the, the floor to, to, to Wojciech and yeah, have, have fun Thank and enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again, Martin. <laughs> so now when you know that the overcooled vapor that's... Oh, oh, sorry. Can, can we interrupt just briefly again in case Anya wants to introduce herself because she said she might not be here for the whole okay. time and some people yeah. might recognize her? Of course, of course. Oh, okay, thank you. So, Anya, if you're still here and if you're able and eager to introduce yourself, and while well, I give her a second to respond and see if she's still here and listening. Fun fact we have people joining from several different countries around the world. Anya, to my knowledge, is the only one of you who has joined us from two different countries in this same session because she finished work at CERN and was walking home well connected. Uh, she, she's busy and she didn't have much time with the little time she had. It was important for her to come uh, see us. So she was using her phone, walking from Switzerland to France, joining. She's the first participant I think I've ever had in one of these sessions who's been in two countries for the same session. So, and it appears she's left. Um, so, yeah. I mean, busy day, but she made the time to join from CERN and made the record for most countries someone's joined with at the same time in a session. So okay. in absence, we'll thank Anya. She'll see it on the YouTube recording and hope she'll be a fan of that, that glory that she has. <laughs> okay. So, so sorry for yet another so, interruption. <laughs> no problem, thank you. Now we are going just to look at what's there in the cloud chamber again. Let me darken the room. <coughs> Uh, my second camera lit. Uh, and if, if anyone wants to try and see what's still going on in the other camera, you can just switch the zoom between uh, speaker and gallery mode if you want the two different points of view. Uh, when we tested this before, and fun fact, it was trying to figure out the best angle for this, which should be right here, uh, that we were testing. Uh, when you guys were in the waiting room and we were a minute or two late getting started, but probably more like five, but that was all my fault. And can anyone turn on their microphone and shout out with excitement if you see a trace coming through? Um, it's hard to tell if we're, oh, no. I, I, I got excited, but you let us know if you saw that. And I'll go around to a couple of different angles. Like this is the best one. So we'll try and keep it here. But sometimes you never yeah. know what, uh, what works out well. Um, and th this is actually a, a really tricky thing to get. So it uh, works out on camera, but I, I think it's working. Oh, there was a good one. Yeah. And again, feel free to shout out and disagree if you're not seeing these. Um, but some of the challenges, like for, there's a couple of teachers here who might be interested in setting one of these up one day. Some of the challenge that goes out uh, if you try and do this is you get a lot of reflected light when you're lighting it up with a light source. Even for my camera, certain ways I hold it, you keep seeing like this, a lot of light. And in person, it's a lot easier when you just have your head uh, moving around rather than a camera where you have people joining from several different countries. 
So me, I can con confirm that I can see in your in your camera. So in the picture, I can see some particles. Uh, they appear for a short, uh, for a couple of seconds, and then their trace disappears. If if you see a very thin path or a very thin trajectory, then it's likely a cosmic muon that came to us from somewhere high in the atmosphere. If it's a wayway or wiggled short path, typically, then it's an electron. And if it's a very thick and very short trace, then it's an alpha particle from the radon decay. Uh and if you're interested in learning all about the different traces and being able to uh, identify them yourself, we're going to be having a session again later on in April with Marco, a friend of mine in uh, Germany, who's the one who originally taught me how to make sense of all the traces. And we're using photos not from a cloud chamber, but from a bubble chamber that were the uh, next generation of particle detectors. And they were the main way a lot of uh, different particles were, generate, uh, were detected at first. Uh, for a couple of decades before they were eventually superseded by the wire chamber, which I always need to mention if we're talking about detectors, because <laughs> another French person, well, French and Polish, Georges Charpak, who won the Nobel Prize for wire chambers. Um, I'll wait till sometime later, maybe during Marco's session, to interrupt and explain a bit more about how wire chambers work. Cool. So I think we should stop for now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And let me switch the lights on again. And we will move to a bit more sophisticated particle detector. So I'm putting all the cloud chambers aside because we aren't going to use them anymore. Now I'm going to show you a much smaller particle detector which is here, it's this tiny box. And the detector itself is just within the small window uh, somewhere here. I hope you can see it. It's about oh, what? I should, have, I should have kept this one, oh, sorry. Thank, thank you very much, no but, problem. It's, should I switch to it now? You, you, you can do it, yes, okay. if you want. Yeah, I was just sending the, uh, the invite link to um, someone who emailed me and said, hey, and joined. So I got distracted and I didn't do a good job as a cameraman. Huh. Uh, or you don't have to do it. In, in the end, I have a photos in my slides. So okay, maybe I can I, show I, them. It, it's less than 15 seconds away. If <laughs> one is here still, or if I've wasted too much time already. It's fine. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> I'm ready now for one. <laughs> Sorry about that. So it's here. Actually, on the picture, on the right hand side, there's the chip that's inside this this black box here. So, and the and the uh, gray window, sort of a window, the gray uh, small desk in the in the middle is the detector itself. It's a very pure silicon who's there to play the same role as the overcooled or over, uh, overcooled vapor that was there in the cloud chamber. So in this tiny window, there's the detector and the whole box is there to read out the detector and to visualize what's happening there in our computer. And, and maybe you already said what I was doing in the chat, but I, I didn't hear you say, uh, the single, uh, that's a single silicon crystal. So that whole thing only detects like a yes or no that something has gone through that one. Uh, Rather than a, like an array of crystals. Uh, through, the, through each pixel, yes. So, so it, like it, that's it, one single pixel in the picture. No, it consists of 256 times 256 pixels. Okay. So on, on an area of one centimeter times one centimeter, there are, I don't know, <laughs> 50K pixels. 
Oh, oh, okay, okay. So it's uh, <laughs> it, it's pretty high resolution. Yes, yes, yes. You, you could, and if you're thinking of like a demonstration detector, or like to demonstrate the idea, <clears throat> the idea of how it works, you could take like blocks and have one block, one block, one block to have all of those as one crystal that either lights up or doesn't. Yeah. I can see, I can see, but it's not happening here. Yeah, 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 no. <laughs> so each pixel is sort of a detector by itself. It gives you an information whether or not a charged particle passed through that pixel. And you can only see a, oh, actually, let's have a look at what we can see. So the easiest thing is a photon hitting one of the pixels. So in the detector, when a photon hits the detector, it always hits just one pixel. And you will see these dots here at the bottom left. So each dot is a one photon that hit the one pixel in our detector. Electrons, on the other hand, at the top right, they hit several pixels because they travel through the, the detector. They travel through the matter the detector consists of and their trajectories are bounded, they are uh, because again, the electrons undergo collisions with other electrons that are there in the matter from which the detector consists, and they can, they can, uh, how to say it? Uh, to separate. To this, sorry, I was checking everything. Was okay, on. Is it, what, what was the last five seconds you said? I, I was listening. <laughs> so, so, so if, if an electron hits another electron, then it collides with it and. Get, What's the word? It's a collision and they re rebound. Yeah, bounce yeah, off so exactly. Bounce off. Uh, however, if you have a muon hitting your detector in the good way, the detector is very thin. It's about 0.3 millimeters thick. But if it hits it from the top, then it can actually hit several pixels. And if you wait long enough, you will see such a muon. And it's here on the bottom left, then you will see a, a trace consisting of several pixel hits. And yeah, it's a relatively long trajectory because a muon making a signal in the detector uh, doesn't lose much energy by itself and it doesn't change its direction because of its heavy mass. One last thing, alpha particle, like here in the cloud chamber where it's made a a very thick path, a short one, because it loses its energy very effectively. Uh, in our silicon detector, it makes tra traces like this. Each blob here on the top left is one alpha particle that's basically stopped in the detector. It deposits all its energy in the very thin layer of the detector. And that's it. So, if you watch it for a very long time, so if you watch it for six hours, then you will see something like this. And each path, each dot, each blob is one particle of the corresponding kind that hit the detector within the six hours window within which it was watched. So, so depending on how you collect your data, like how, how it's stored afterwards. That's a picture that was taken with an exposure of several hours. Exactly. Could, is the data stored in such a way you could skip to a part where it was only a couple minutes or a couple yeah. of seconds yeah. to pinpoint one individual yeah. collision? Yeah, yeah, you can do it. And I interrupted you were just about to say that before I asked if you could do that. <laughs> I'm not sure, but uh, I was about to show you what happens after five minutes of watching the detector if you expose it to a uranium glass. Uranium, it's sort of a common isotope. It's uh, actually used to color glass in a very nice green color like this. And you will see yourself that it's actually radioactive. And yeah, I will show you. If you take your detector to the airplane, then you will see it more, irradiated by the cosmic rays. So here, the pattern, which is after watching the, the detector for some time, there are more muons, that's the point, because muons 
even though they can reach the, the air surface, they are still more common, the higher in the atmosphere. And uh, yeah, so that's it. Oh. And, and fun fact that I'd need to fact check if it's true. For that reason, pilots and flight crews on airplanes need to be checked for radiation exposure. Do, do you know if I'm just thinking I heard that somewhere? Is that a, a confirmed fact? I, I think so, yes. Okay. Uh, so our, we both think so. And on the Zoom, there was supposed to be two kids whose dad is a pilot for Air France. And they could have asked him, but I don't see them in there. Yeah. So if you're there and I uh, like just don't notice you, go ask Nico if that's true. Does he need to wear um, something that checks the amount of radiation he has as a pilot? In any case, the amount of radiation that they receive is about 10 times higher than we living on the Earth's surface. In the obscure units that are called sieverts, you receive about 0.14 microsieverts each hour on the Earth, and you receive 1.7 of them each hour in the airplane. So approximately 10, 10 times more. Good. If you put your detector to a beam of accelerated particles at an SPS accelerator at CERN, then you will see this picture. So again, depending on what the accelerated particles are, but here you could see some muons and some pions. So now let's move to me showing you the detector in action. So I share the screen with the detector window. Hope you can see it. So now the dark panel in the middle is actually the area, this, it displays the area of the detector. So it has 256 pixels times 256. And so this is pixel. live from uh, this right now, right? That's uh, like that's now it's oh, live. Oh, now, now it's live. Okay, yeah. so it's right, right, right. We wouldn't have that much radiation live yeah. unless the source right there, of <laughs> Exactly. Of course. So we are watching it, and some. Oh, we got one. <laughs> <laughs> some particles are coming. Uh, however, we can increase their amount if we put the uranium glass, for instance, the, the green thing, the green glass close to the detector. So I'm doing it and all of a sudden particles are popping up in the detector much faster than, than it was before without the glass. And, and quick zoom tip that a lot of you probably already know, but one or two of you might gain a lot from, from this. If you want to change the size of uh, what white text screen being shared is, you can click that bar over and you can adjust it so you can see the video of where he's putting the source bigger if you want to be able to visualize both at the same time. Because by default, the video with us is going to be tiny on your screen. And if you want to just see a little bit better where he's putting the source, uh, you can slide the, the thing over. Unless you're joining from a mobile phone or tablet. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Thank you. So with the uranium, you can mostly see electrons and photons uh, reaching the detector. There are very little alpha particles. I can see one. I'm not sure whether it's from the glass itself or from a radon that's everywhere here in the air. We can stop this and restart and take a source of alpha particles. So this is called americium. It's a very common source of alpha particles in laboratories. And as, as, as we are getting close to it. So. You used to, so like an, an old teacher's trick, you used to be able to uh, get it out of old smoke detectors. Exactly. Well, yeah. or you still could if you got an old smoke detector, but they, in most places, I, I would assume it's the same across the EU, but correct me if I'm wrong. In most places, they've changed what the radioactive source is in a smoke detector or how it works entirely. Uh, so, in a smoke detector, there's the source of alpha particles, like this one, and there's a detector of the alpha particles, and if they are coming at the expected rate, then everything's fine. However, if there is the, you know, the, if, if there is a fire, like, like and the, the, the smoke blocks and the smoke, and, and just, yeah, just you. like exactly. um, you explained earlier how alpha particles don't penetrate far because they're big and they'll dump all their energy where it's, they go. 
if they hit a particle of smoke, then, or should I let you finish the explanation? I can do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> if they hit the smoke, they are stopped and the detector can see less of particles than expected. And it realizes by this fact that there is a fire and that there is a smoke coming in to the, uh, to in between the detector and the source. Good. So let me demonstrate this. How and, and just to is finish it? that idea, because there's a couple of teachers joined. You might already know this trick, but if you want a relatively cheap radioactive source, especially because there's a lot of new regulations, you can't necessarily just order or buy one easily. You could get one from a radioactive detector, uh, it's like from a, from a smoke detector. Um, so that was a common hack for physics teachers. Um, but check your regulations if you're going to try and use it in a school because near the same time in a lot of uh, schools or jurisdictions, like a lot of countries, uh, regulation made it so that you're not allowed to use radioactive sources in schools, um, even if you know how to do so safely. So uh, if you get caught doing it, don't tell them I told you how to do it. <laughs> so let me now demonstrate how easy it is to stop off particles. I insert a, a paper, just a paper, ordinary one. Put the detect, put the source very close to the detector. And I'm starting record. Oh no, what's happening? Have you got a paper, Michael, please? <laughs> a paper where I started writing ideas of uh, demonstrations to try and make inspired by some of your explanations. Thank today. you. So if we it, was, the right it, angle, you it was performed. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and if you haven't noticed, I no. changed the spotlight. So feel free to like adjust your view setting so you can see that is the piece of paper just up close. So there's a paper between the source and the detector, and it stops all the alpha particles from the source. If I put the paper off, we can immediately see uh, alpha particles reaching the detector. Now I put it there back and nothing reaches it. So one last thing. I love uh, that demo. Do, do we need the camera still? Or should I no, it? I don't. Yeah. It's fine. Thank you. So I'd like to show you how the distance of the detector and the source matters. So I'm recording now and moving the source closer and closer to the detector. And still, you can see nothing, no off particles in the detector. There's about five centimeters distance between the two of them. and and nothing's happening. As I move them closer and closer to a distance of a couple of centimeters, very few centimeters, two or three, all of a sudden, off particles reach the detector. So what's stopping them here is just the air. So from this, we can conclude that a layer of about three, two or three centimeters of air can actually stop off particles. So, and, to, and so even less of that of smoke. You know, smoke and even, exactly. exactly. Actually, what protects us, our bodies, from our, of particles is a very thin layer of dead skin that's there on our yeah, skin. Huh. I wonder if it evolves specifically to be that way, if it was by coincidence, like you keep <laughs> dead skin, or not sure. probably it evolved for sunlight because that. That does a lot of bad things to work in bright sunlight. But that, that's interesting. That, that's yeah. another new thing I learned today. Uh, by the way, so in the end, the, the very thin layer of dead skin here protects us from alpha particles. So, so uh, like the, people who go to beauty salons and use like a stone to rub off their skin to get things nice and shiny, they're putting themselves at risk. For <laughs> I wouldn't say so because we aren't typically exposed to high doses, uh, but still, yeah. The skin well, protects but, us. But, that, but that's why you don't see uh, many well manicured particle physicists. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing how the alpha radiation can hurt us is if we eat the, <laughs> the source. So the conclusion from today's session don't eat sources of alpha. <laughs> Good. So I put it back to the detector. And this is for the detector to say goodbye. However, I am not saying goodbye. Give me a couple more minutes, yeah, if yeah, I may. As, as long as you want. And like anyone who's in a hurry will leave, like as we saw um, 
Anya was very busy, I believe, already. Um, same thing for you guys, but I think and hope a lot of you guys are interested. And some of you would probably even say if we stayed like five hours more and kept on <laughs> enjoying things, but we're not going to do that this time. I, I don't think I'm still really tired after the Science on Stage Festival. Uh, yeah. So, what I want to show you is what we can do as particle physicists if we have gray detectors like this one, but if we use many of them at a time. So we can build detectors as huge as this one in the, in the slide that you are looking at. Uh, the, the experiment I'm showing you is called the Atlas detector. It's located at CERN at the Swiss Franc border near Geneva. And, and anyone who wants to see it in detail, uh, we had a virtual visit of it with Steve Goldfarb uh, showing us around the different parts of it. Uh, that was supposed to be recorded, but Steve hasn't found the file for me, but we recorded the one from last year, and that's up in the Particle Physics for Kids playlist on my YouTube channel. So if you want to see inside the Atlas detector, you can check out that recording. And tentatively, I'm going to try and go, well, try and have a virtual visit of the Atlas control room with Steve in a couple of weeks. We were going to try and do another one of the detector before they start the beam line up. You probably know the exact date this month they're starting to be in line, right? Maybe not, <laughs> but put you on the spot. No. The, the last I heard, but like I don't work at CERN, it's just every once in a while when I'm trying to plan a virtual visit, someone tells me, well, the maintenance on uh, Atlas is this day, this day, and this day, and then the beam line's going up. The tentative was, I think it was the 16th. I, I, I actually tried, do you know so, Connie Potter? Well, of course. I tried to get, well, we, we were brainstorming ideas of having like a festival of the beam, beam line and trying to have like a bike ride or like a, a <laughs> run or walk around the, the course of the detector to celebrate the beam line coming back up. Uh, yeah. But we, we didn't do it this time. But next time it reopens after a shutdown, talk to people or remind me to try and talk to okay. people so, so we do that. Yeah. And I apologize for not knowing the exact date, sorry about it, but it's uh, happening soon. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of people on Atlas, not everyone knows, needs to know the date that they turn it on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As long as one guy at least turns on the, det the detector at the right time, no, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's a team of people. <laughs> but uh, Still, that's yeah, the point. There's, um, and if you guys are interested, uh, well, I, I don't know for sure, but you do a lot of data analysis with the exactly, images. Exactly. Rather than planning when they'll take the data, it's what's done with the images afterwards. Exactly. I've been working with the data taken in, 2015, from, in the period from 2015 to 2018. And I've been analyzing that for years, and I will be doing that, the same thing for couple more years and so, only after that i will move to the analysis of data that are going to be taken this so, year so 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 we could say uh certain data arriving in the czech republic is kind of like hollywood movies arriving in france it's always a year or two after it comes out. <laughs> yeah something like that well, well I, we can, you, you said 2015 yeah. to 2017 18 yeah okay so after like the run after the Higgs boson was discovered, right? Or confirmed? Uh, that's right. That's right. The okay. Higgs boson was discovered or it announced. Its discovery announcement was made in 12, 2012. July 4th. <laughs> exactly. I've analyzed the data set as well. But after I've exploited what I wanted to do with it, I moved to the bigger data set taken in more recently. And and, and two fun facts about that announcement on July 4th, which I might get completely wrong, and you can correct me if you know better than me. So the announcement was made by Fabiola. Fabiola who, yeah, okay. and I forget how to pronounce her last name, even though I speak Italian. Genotti. 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 Yeah, okay. So. Uh, hopefully she doesn't watch this video. And, she <laughs> <tends to. laughs> uh, and at the time, she was the Atlas spokesperson. So the spokesperson of the Atlas detector of Voitex works. Uh, but those of you who know a lot about CERN will know now she's the, is it called the Director General? She's the boss yes, in charge yes, of yes, 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 yes. Director General of CERN. And I had another fun fact, but I lost my train of thought. Uh, if I think of it again, I'll interrupt you. <laughs> okay, don't worry, do it. So I'm showing you a picture of the Atlas detector and that's it.
Uh, it's a huge detector. It's a sort of a cylinder that's laying on. It's 44 meters long. It has about 25 meters of diameter. And I will show you a couple more photos. It weighs about 7,000 tons. And we can view it as a oversized camera, pretty much same type of camera like this one we were looking at, or a cloud chamber. Yeah. All these devices are there to measure the radioactive radiation, particles born somewhere and passing the, through the matter of the detector. Here we are looking inside the Atlas detector at a point in time when the detector wasn't yet there. You know, it's difficult to take a photo of it because it's in a cavern that's just a tiny bit more big than, than the detector itself. So the but, but at least they open it up for uh, the, when Steve was showing us around. It, that's right. It's closed to detect things, but uh, we asked Steve very nicely, can you make sure they open it up <laughs> for the visit? And they open the whole thing up for us. <laughs> <laughs> so in fact, here on the next uh, picture, you can see how it's being opened. And there's a huge, por huge part of the detector being moved from the, from the center away. Oh, and I don't think what? they opened it quite that much for us. It was the thing where they didn't <laughs> come out. Yeah. Yeah. Like they, they didn't take it apart to every individual piece. It's it's like um, what's it like Lego? If you take it apart, you can't figure out how to get it back together. <laughs> <laughs> One last picture for you: the Atlas control control room. That's where the button on and off is pushed. <laughs> and and like I said, I. Steve uh, tentatively said he'd do a virtual visit with us of the Atlas control room sometime. Uh, I, I also didn't set a date with him, and he's a, a very important guy who's busy. So hopefully, I haven't left it too long to, to get that on the schedule. But tentatively, it's been like verbally confirmed. He said, Yeah, that sounds great. We'll show you around. Uh, I think it was actually his idea because I didn't realize it was going to be interesting to see what's around. And he said they've changed a lot from the last run, they've changed the control room, apparently. Yeah. I, I haven't I been there know, for years, years Atlas, actually. Well, yeah. um, uh, but like I've, I've been in the Atlas control room, but apparently it's different than when I was there in 2018. So I'm eager to see, uh, see my way around it. Hopefully we'll get to share it with you guys. So I think that's it. In the end, you get images like this from the Atlas experiment. If all the information about detected particles that pass through the matter of the detector, if all is gathered together and analyzed, you can get a picture of what happened in a proton-proton collision with protons at a very high energy. And in such a collision, many particles can be born. And actually, the Atlas detector is there to <coughs> make a photo of their directions, energies, and the trajectories and, and with all that detail in the photos and it's taking what 400 million photos a second that's right then that's a huge amount of data right that's quite a huge amount yes i i wonder if we could learn about what they do with all that data <laughs> luckily on thursday we have a virtual visit of the cern data center so if cool. you have any questions about what happens with the data and they like what they do with it there then we'll get to see our way around and you can ask the people who work there and know all about what they do with that a humongous amount of data, uh, what's going on and how they manage. What, one of the biggest data sets in the world, possibly the world's biggest data set. I, I don't know. It's in, odd, but I'm not even sure how in, you quantify that. In particle physics, most likely, yes. Oh, how, well, definitely in particle physics, but yeah. like of any thing, because CERN is the biggest science lab anywhere in the world. That's right, that's right. However, companies that treat, I would say, an order of magnitude more data than us at CERN are, like without any diet, <laughs> doubt, Facebook, Google. And, to just and, spy on us. That, exactly. They know that you're here, this virtual camp. <laughs> I, I, I assume they probably died. I, I don't know what they <laughs> Anyway. Here, we people on Atlas, we also do need to analyze huge amounts of data. Let me say it, each year, the Atlas detector records about 
10 petabytes of data, or yeah, peta means 1,000 terabytes, so an equivalent of 1,000 hard drives. Uh, and they, they actually do at the, the data center have thousands of hard drives. And I was surprised when I saw it and they explained that, um, well, like I knew they had a lot of data, but I thought it was like gonna be really big hard drives or like supercomputer style from the eighties and nineties. But someone there explained to me that the, the price point of off the counter uh, electronics and computer components has gotten down to the point that it's actually cheaper just to buy mass manufactured hard drives like you guys would buy from an electronics store from Amazon. Um, unless it's changed since 2018 when they showed me around. Yeah. So like it, it actually is thousands of hard drives. It's not the equivalent of thousands of your hard drives. That, that's literally what it is. And unless like me, you're connecting from a laptop, then you're probably on solid state now, unless it's an old one. And even if you're not, a laptop hard drive is not the model of a hard drive they use. Uh, that's right, yes. <laughs> Michael's totally right in yeah. everything right. he said. Further into the tangent, laptop hard drives, like they've not built the same way, but <laughs> we're not going to talk about it. <laughs> One last thing, let me advertise the film A Day with Particles. That's about one day in a life of a particle physicist working on Atlas. And we've made the film with Martin, who was there, and that you've seen with uh, another friend of us, Daniel Shairik, who's a very good uh, in drawing. So he, the, the film is, is, huge parts of it are animated. And also with Connie Potter, who came up with the idea to make such a film. So you can find it on YouTube. So and, feel free to watch I, it. I sent the link out while with the uh, announcement that this uh, camp was happening, saying if you'd like to see more about uh, Wojtek's life and get to know him before you came here. Because I sent yeah. things out late, then probably most of you didn't have the time to watch it before, uh, before coming here. Uh, yeah. But I'd recommend uh, having a look at it. It's a really good film. It, it's been, it, it got a number of prizes, like even in Toronto, where I grew up. For Toronto. In Toronto, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I don't remember all of the cities where it won prizes at a film festival, but I, I know there's a list of several of them. And I was really excited. I, I got to take a selfie uh, with them. No, it wasn't a selfie. We got someone else to take the photo, but a photo of his office, which is featured prominently in the, the video with uh, him and Martin in there. So there's me uh, in one of the typical scenes from it. So do check it out. Like it's, it's a, already he's like a really nice, cool and friendly guy. You want to know more about his life, but also it's a good insight <laughs> into what it is like to be a particle physicist. Oh, I, I, I know I saw F.A. join from Turkey and he wants to, I think go into particle physics, at least he knows for sure for science and he knows an amazing amount about particle physics. So he might be particularly interested in what his life could be like if he becomes a particle physicist. So sure. definitely watch that. Thanks for the <laughs> advertisement. Oh, <laughs> and, with, with pleasure. <laughs> and I think we can stop here and make room for some questions if... Uh, excellent, yes. So you guys have been shy uh, the whole time or maybe not understanding when I said, please do uh, ask questions when we're going. Feel free to interrupt, but hopefully have some questions that have come up uh, over the course of the session that you want to ask now. And if you start asking questions, it'll prove to us too that you paid attention and you were interested. So hopefully we get at least one or two questions before we say goodbye to you guys. And if possible, try and turn on your microphone and we'll try and hear you because it's always nice to hear your voice and because uh, I don't feel like reading, but I will read if you prefer that. Uh, but if you're comfortable and confident uh, speaking in English, uh, even if your level isn't very good, please jump on your mic. If you want to show your face, I'm sure Wojtek would love to see you, but don't feel any obligation. Some of you guys probably like didn't get dressed to come or, you know, didn't brush your hair right. Uh, so any questions or anyone who wants to say hi and say where are you joining from, please do that now before we say goodbye. Hello. I know we hear from you. Yes, we, we, we heard you start talking more and we'll see if you're loud enough. 
No, I have uh, exams tomorrow, so I can uh, really attend today. I'm sorry. Good well, luck. Well, good luck with your okay. exams. But I, I was telling Wojtek, I was pretty sure you'd end up coming, and that uh, unless there's something very major going on in your life, then uh, you probably would not be able to make it. But with exams, uh, very best of luck in the exams. If there's anything related to physics, you have two reasonably good coaches, feel free to ask us a question or two for your exam. But if it's another subject, I, I might be good at it, but like probably just do whatever your teacher said or like do whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I already uh, gained a hundred on my physics exam, but thank you. Oh, congratulations. Uh, well done. Thank you. So does, does anyone else have any questions or are brave to say hi? And we lost a couple of people because we went late and a couple of the people I know already. Uh, Paul was one of the main people uh, at Science on Stage Festival, so he's probably exhausted. Usually he'd jump on and say hi, but he's probably having trouble staying awake after the weekend with so much work and so little sleep. Uh, and some of the others are quite shy. Um, so we might not hear any questions from him. I'm just going to check the chat. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, thank you or excellent uh, coming in the chat. So anyone, if you have questions, we'll do a countdown from like 10 or so. If no one has any questions, we'll assume that you guys are too shy at the moment uh, to ask anything. Uh, from five, five, four, three. Okay, I have a question. I have a question. Yes, yes, please, yes. But it's about uh, general physics. Can I ask it? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. that sounds great. Yeah, uh, I was reading some uh, book about quantum chromodynamics and I wondered something. Uh, it's about general physics. And as I have two physicists right now, I can ask it, I guess. Hopefully. <laughs> and, I'll, and, and I'll warn you, I'm, I'm not great in quantum thermodynamics. Like if it's anything particularly advanced, I'll probably have to admit, like, I, I don't know, but, but ask away. No problem. I will try my luck. Uh, can I ask, what's the proof of Pauli exclu exclusion principle? What's the proof of that? I would put it very simply. The fact that we exist, that there's the nature, that the, the enormous variety in, in the, the period, periodic table of elements. So it's a clear proof of the of the Pauli ex exclusion principle, I would say. You know that atoms are formed by a heavy nucleus and a cloud of electrons. If all the electrons would be allowed to be in the same physical state with the same energy, same momentum, spin, and so on, then we would basically have just one type of atoms. There would be no chemical reactions. There would be very little reasons for atoms to bound to each other and to form molecules. Uh, yeah, I would say that's it. The fortunate fact that there's the <laughs> Pauli exclusion principle makes atoms very different from each other. They differ in the number of electrons and the number of electrons determines their properties. And you can see that each in each row in each column of the periodic table of elements you have atoms with pretty different properties and some of them can bound to each other and form more complex structures all this thanks to the Pauli exclusion principle and the fact that the electrons cannot be in one system in the same physical state and, and I, I guess you could say like in some ways it allows there to be a variety a greater variety of energy levels populated that like it, it kind of gives structure to where it could be so more varieties could exist similar to like if you imagine things all on the earth or objects if they weren't rigid to give them structure everything would go to the lowest energy state and things would just be yeah. round and the earth would be round and boring this isn't a great analogy is it at least like a mediocre no like <laughs> completely off uh, yeah. but but like 
if everything was just in a lower energy state rather than forced to be in a higher energy state, there would be a lot less permutations possible. Is, is that consistent with your idea at least? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and thanks for joining despite having uh, an exam tomorrow. <laughs> and I, I started the countdown. Uh, do you have any more questions, Efe? I Actually, I don't today. OK. <laughs> uh, and I don't, I don't think anyone else has any questions. Feel free to shout out and interrupt uh, if I'm wrong with that assumption. Um, so we're, we're, we're going to say goodbye. And thank you for joining us. Remember. Uh, virtual visit of the CERN data center on Thursday. I think it's at seven because um, I know I am busy earlier than that. So hopefully I said it's at seven. It's at whatever time I said it is. And then on Tuesday, the 5th of April, the low energy ion ring uh, at CERN again. And that was the visit that was originally scheduled. It was a Saturday a while ago. And it was hard to get the right number of guides on a Saturday. So it's been rescheduled till Tuesday. Uh, for the rest of April, there's a lot of interesting things coming up. As I mentioned throughout this session, it's up to me to look at a calendar and talk to the great people who uh, seem to rearrange everything so that we can do this. Um, so that'll be coming out soon by the latest by Tuesday's session. So, you know, Tuesday, like be there. I'll announce the others, but I'll send all the others out by email. Um, so th this has been really great. It's, it's, it's been one of my very favorite sessions, uh, getting to meet you, getting to be here, see things, make the cloud chamber. Uh, so this has been really amazing. Uh, thank you very much for this. Thank you very much, Michael, for having invited me and thank you all for watching. <laughs> so goodbye.